All right, hello, software engineers. So now, uh, the third video on design patterns, we're gonna do behavioral. This one will be a bit shorter, so don't worry. The last one, we looked at a lot of code here. I'm just gonna do some brief uh, demonstrations and examples and, and, and let you peruse the code uh, as you feel you need to. But let's go ahead and jump into the slide. So we talked about how behavioral design patterns relate to how classes interact or how certain functionalities are performed. An example of this are iterators. So iterators are uh, are a design pattern. You know, whenever you're looking at a collection, it's a very common practice to say, I want to visit every element in this collection exactly one time. Uh, whether that's a list, whether that's a map, whether that's a set, uh, whether that's a tree, we often use iterators to make sure that we visit every element exactly once. And that's the uh, nature of the iterator design pattern. And typically the way it's used is that there is a boolean has next function, which checks, is there a next element? If that's false, you're at the end of the collection. If that is true, then you go to the next element. And these are so important this idea of iterators they're so important that they're built into the java array list length list and hash set data types uh whenever you loop over it such as in java for item in collection or in python for item in collection that is using the idea of an iterator now java has a formal definition java.util.iterator and that is an implementation of the design pattern, but that's actually a, a, a part of the collections framework. Remember when we're talking framework, we're talking partially implemented solutions as opposed to a pattern, which is an idea. And so the idea of the iterator can be separated from that because the idea of the iterator is if you make your own data type or your own data structure, uh, maybe it's more complicated, it can still have an iterator and it would still be a good idea to implement an iterator such that you can visit every element exactly one time. So iterators are uh, accepted common examples of behavioral design patterns. Another design pattern that we're gonna talk about, a good working example of that is sorting. Uh, so let's say you your Java program had some tabular data. I, I, I took this from Wikipedia. This is the state population or estimated population. Uh, and let's say you are building this table and you are you are representing each of the records as uh, as some class E. And your table is effectively just a list of class E, you know. And when you're displaying the table, you iterate through the list, and each uh, row is generated by looking at that data and producing the graphical representation. That's a reasonable thing you would do. Well, if we go to the Wikipedia page, Wikipedia uh, United States Populations, we can see if I scroll down to this uh, scroll down to this table that I borrowed from, I can sort, let's say I don't want to sort by population, I can sort by state name or territory name. I can sort by the estimated population in 2019 rather than the, uh, the, the population of the official census in 2010. I could look at which, whoops, I could look at which areas are changing or growing so for example dc's growing utah's growing scroll down here west virginia sadly shrinking um you know all of this is therefore available and you can sort any way you want this is a common technique that we want to be able to do and the way that this is often implemented um in our uh, programs is through the use of a comparator. You, if you've taken 2110, you've used a comparator. We, we've required you to use it. And the idea is you write individual comparator classes that say different ways to sort the same data type. So if I had a data type state and that had a state name, a population, a growth percentage, I could make sort state name ascending, sort state name descending. Sort population ascending, sort population descending. And each of those different sorting techniques is a separate class that implements the interface comparator. 
Well, guess what? That is a design pattern and that is called a strategy. The idea of a strategy is that we specify an interface for a behavior. Uh, specifically, when we're looking at the comparator, we're deciding how are we going to compare two elements. Given two elements, which should come first, which should come second. That's what the comparator does. And all of our classes that implement this interface are going to be able to sort the same thing. They're going to be able to sort whatever E is, but they're going to sort it in different ways. They all adhere to the same interface. Each of them just implements that interface in a different way. And, and, and a general diagram for this would be something like we have this interface strategy. We have several concrete implementations. You know, sort, sort by state name, sort by population, sort by population change. And the context will simply create or select whichever concrete implementation it needs at runtime. Uh, so every time you could, for instance, tie uh, an action listener to whenever you click one of those uh, headings, like we do here, it sorts by that particular element and it reverses the sort. You could do some Boolean logic for that, right? But you just simply select the correct means of comparing two instances of E, that is select the correct concrete comparator, and the code is written to use the abstract interface so that way uh, it, it's very flexible. And it allows us to add over time different strategies without changing the existing strategies or without necessarily needing to change much of the client program. You have to change it a bit because it has to find the, the correct concrete example. But that is a strategy design pattern. Now this may seem a bit sim similar to concrete factory, but the difference is when we're talking about a concrete factory, like we did in the creational, we're very much talking about the client only going to the factory and ordering something and getting the, the, the abstract uh, or getting the uh, instance of the abstract class that it wants, the particular kind of abstract class. Here with strategy, we're talking about modeling a behavior. So this is almost more like functional programming, and you can think of this class as sort of like implementing a particular function. And some examples where this is used is um, things like, you know, are you going to pay by credit card, by PayPal? Each of those could be implemented as a strategy. And at runtime, that is at checkout time, uh, depending on which radio button you check, it selects the correct strategy to use. So that is a strategy design pattern. Um, the last one we want to talk about is updates. What if there's something in your program some variable or some state that when it changes, the program needs to update several different things. Uh, for example, let's say you are making a scoreboard that updates whenever uh, an event occurs, a basket is scored, and it updates that scoreboard at the time the change occurs. At the time the underlying data changes, something responds to that change. Well, you can think of this as, as two different types of updates. There's push updates. The data source informs all the interested parties. Hey, you know, this thing has changed. Everyone who needs to be aware of it, like, it has changed. That's a push update. And this is similar to GitHub, right? You push to GitHub, some change occurs. At that point, that is going to uh, get all of the observers to do a pull. They're going to say, oh, that's changed. Well, let me update what I need to update. It's going to go to that part of the system and check. So how would you program this? Well, one problem is we're already talking about adding a dependency, right? If this class has some state variable change, it needs to inform all these other classes. How can we do that, the, the, the class that changes, updating all the classes that need to react to that change? in a way that limits the coupling as much as possible. That is to say, we want the class that is being observed and the observers to have as little coupling as we can. How would we program this? Well, one way to do that is using an observer. The idea is there is some, uh, there is some observer interface that is used to observe a particular subject the subject has a bunch of subscribers 
you know, hey, you want to you want to get the latest news from scoreboard data class? Well, subscribe to my news feed or subscribe to my YouTube channel. Hit that like button. Right? That's that's effectively what this is. It's it's like an email subscription. You can subscribe to the listserv and you can attach it. And the idea is the subject maintains a list of people who are observing it. That is if I'm the subject, I know I am being observed, and I know it's these things, this list of things that is observing me. However, I intentionally do not know why I'm being observed, which may sound a bit creepy when we're talking about surveillance, but from a standpoint of object design, is actually a very reasonable thing, because if the subject knows why it's being observed, that could lead to tighter coupling, which is bad. Instead, it will simply say, okay, something has changed. Hey, everyone that's observing me, you know, hey, hey, over here, something's changed. Come check it out, right? Whatever the, the concrete observers do in response to that change is subject doesn't care. And I have a brief code example for this. Uh, uh, and so we'll actually go over code examples as well for the strategy pattern, but let's start with the observer. And in fact, the observer is such a such a common design pattern that the Java language has actually integrated it. So here I have this class called integer subject, and this class integer subject simply is just gonna store some integer state. And whenever that state changes, it's gonna notify all its observers. Well, like I said, Java has built this in it seems so important. And so I can extend observable. And observable is an interface, uh, or excuse me, it's an abstract class. And within the observable class, while I, I don't have it here because uh, it's embedded within the class, there's a list of observers. And whenever I want to notify the observers, I set a flag that says, hey, something has changed. And then I notify all my observers that the like what particular piece of information they need to understand that the change has occurred. I send them uh, specifically in this case the state variable. The subject doesn't care what happens to it. So this is just a process of notifying, hey, everyone that's watching me and waiting for change, that's happened. So so you go do what you do. So what do they do with this? How do, how do observers subscribe to a particular instance of integer subject? Well, since this is built into Java, we can simply say, okay, here's our integer subject. We create a bunch of observers and then we attach them. And this is like subscribing, right? You, if you subscribe to our YouTube channel, you hopefully get notified when we upload videos. Although it doesn't really work that way anymore. It's weird and I don't get it, but nonetheless, uh, you, you have subscribe. So all these observers are adding themselves to subject or subject, I should say, is adding this list of observers. Subject doesn't know what these observers do. It just knows, hey, these things are, are observing me now. Then if I perform some state change, subject set change, subject can say, okay, in addition to making this change, I'm going to notify everyone, hey, a change has occurred. From there, each of these observers has a method called update, and it takes in um, both the thing being observed uh, and any, uh, and if, if for this object arg, what that's taking in is whatever I pass in that notify observers. So if you take a look, uh, I'm passing in, an, and I put an object wrapper because state's just an int. Uh, so this would be, for example, when I set state to 15, this value would be 15. From there, the observer uh, can take in the thing it's observing, and then we could just do a typecast to the integer subject. That way we can call the integer subject uh, get state function. Uh, this typecast is done because this particular class, I've designed it, so it's only going to observe integer subjects, so this is fairly safe. Uh, from there, 
In addition to subscribe, there's also an unsubscribe button. So the subscribe button is sub is the observable class. So in this case, subject or the observable instance, I should say. In this case, subject dot add observer, and then whatever observer is being added, and then the uh, unsubscribe button is delete observer. And so if you'll notice. I add three observers, um, and all these observers do is they take whatever number is an in integer subject, and they just print, uh, in, in this case, that number in hexadecimal, that number in octal, and that number in binary. So when I run this, the stage is changed, to, or the, the state is changed to 15. Fifth, when I call set state 15, that's going to call notify all observers, which in this case is one instance of binary observer, one instance of hectal, and one instance of octal. Again, this code is uploaded. Uh, you can see the link in the description below or on the uh, class website for the article for this assignment. And it's going to, uh, each observer is going to print. So binary, the number 15 is 1111. The octal, it's 17. The hex string is F. I'm then going to unsubscribe the binary. So the binary will no longer be notified uh, whenever this subject changes. I then call set state again. That immediately notifies uh, the observer classes. But since now it's only octal and hex string, I get octal 12 and hex string A. Quick demo uh, for the strategy pattern. And you can take a look at this. This is very, very broad, but the idea is... Um, we have some class shopping cart. We add two items and then I can pass uh, either. I can choose which of these I use. I wouldn't do both, but I could just do cart.pay new PayPal strategy, cart.pay credit card strategy. But both of these implement the uh, payment strategy, which is to say they implement some function public void pay. They take in some amount. So you take a look at that PayPal. It's going to take, you know, email and password, and it's going to somehow log into the PayPal servers with that and um, and do the uh, do the payment that way. You know, obviously this is not functional. This is just to illustrate it. But the point is, both of the uh, PayPal strategy and credit card strategy are going to implement this payment strategy class. And then at runtime, I select whichever of those two classes I need. But both of them do the same thing. So again, I wouldn't pick both. I would pick one maybe based on some radio button or whatever. So that is behavioral patterns. The last video is going to be structural patterns. Watch out for that soon, and we'll see you next time. Take care.